Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are on this fine planet. We're here with another very special edition of Wows Alive with our host, Ned Dennison. Hello, everyone. I'm the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. I have one of my fellow executive committee members as our guest today, uh, Mel Cunningham, uh, named now Roberts. So say hello, Mel. Hi, how are you, Ned and Steve? Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Um, Mel, tell us a little bit about your swimming before you hit the marathon scene. Um, so growing up, I was always one of those uh, kids that really wanted to be a swimmer and just was never any good. I remember being um, probably in my early teens and being a freezing cold day in Barrel, New South Wales. And there was no one at the pool, so cold that my coach didn't want to be on the pool deck. And he sat up in the, um, in the, the area where this, we call it a kiosk here. And he made me swim up and down. And he's like, it's cold, do you want to get out? And I'm like, no, I'm not getting out. I want to go to the Olympic Games. I want to represent Australia. And, you know, there was no one else around, but I was just one of those kids that always wanted to swim for Australia. But I didn't have any talent because everything was 50s and 100s and 200s at school. Um, so I kind of like just stuck in there and um, kind of worked my way up and went to state titles and then became a water polo player. So I was a state um, representative for water polo at a junior level and had to train, um, still train for swimming. And it just ended up being that the training for swimming overtook water polo. Um, and then sort of worked my way up. And it wasn't till I was sort of in year 10, 11, 12 at school that I started to go to nationals and was an age group um, medalist for the 800 and the 1500. And, and then sort of just worked my way up there and um, yeah, the rest sort of fell into place with open water swimming. So, um, one of the things that um, I, I, I understand always makes you smile is any mention of Italy. Um, you seem to have this um, love relationship with Italy. Um, I'm not sure whether you adopted them or they adopted you. And uh, it was the, um, the location of your world championship in Rome in 94, if I remember right. So without embarrassing yourself, tell us that the whole attraction of Italy and, and how, you, how, how you came to fall under its spell. Well, it's kind of like what's there not to love about Italy. And um, my first trip was in 93 for Pampax and Pre-Worlds. And it was, my own, it was only my second 25 kilometer event. And I specifically remember, you know, it was a rainy day. There was a huge storm. And if you've ever been to an Italian event, it's either super organized and everyone lined up or it's super casual. And this event was super casual. And I remember we're all sort of like sitting at the tables in this restaurant where it was sort of, we're all congregating before the race going, we're not going to swim today. We're not going to start for another four hours. We're fine. And just hanging out. And then all of a sudden they just went, we're starting in five minutes. And so we're like all putting our hats on and greasing up and we're like, where's our coaches? Where are they? And they're all out in the, on the ocean. And I remember walking down to the water to the start. The start went off, not everyone was in the water. And this lightning strike happened and it like hit just behind where all the coaches were on the boats. And um, this amazing swim that we had in Italy that, should have taken under six hours, took over eight hours. And, you know, we had lightning and sun and um, it was just an amazing event. And we, it was in a, a little town, it started in a, in a place called San Felice and finished in Terracina. And we went back again the next year and we went to a training swim and um, we stayed at a hotel called Hotel Neanderthal. And for some reason, the, the general manager just, you know, loved the Australian team. And he was walking around going, Melissa, you're going to be world champion. And I was like, uh, okay, all right. And then we turned up again in um, September that year and walking in and he had, we like basically walked in, dropped our bags and he's like, Melissa, here's your bruschetta. Cause that was my favorite food. 
and he was like, you're going to be the world champion. And it was just this whole, the whole staff, everybody was just, you know, on board with us and, and were really our biggest cheerleaders. And it was such a fantastic um, experience. And um, I think it just carried on like every year after that, I went back to Italy and the Italian team were really inviting and um, had us back and we, Got to, I got to travel with the Italian team pretty much every summer and um, go to their events and um, you can earn a little bit of money. So you'd swim in one event, you'd earn enough money to get to the next event. Um, and then the swimmers would take me to their homes and cook me spaghetti. And, um, you know, in the middle of training, you'd get out and have an um, espresso. And I, I think I'm Italian in, in another life. And I just love it. And the, the Italian team just was so accommodating and, and lovely to me during my whole career. So you didn't tell us the hotel manager's reaction when you were the world champion. Uh, Come on, you have to tell either way there are a thousand roses. Did he did his head spin around? What you know, what was his reaction? Yeah. Well we came back and um Greg Streppel who won the men's event, he was at the hotel and they they had a party for us and you know we had champagne and you've got to imagine like a this beautiful um outdoor area overlooking the mediterranean and we're like you know shaking champagne bottles and spraying it everywhere and um just having a fan like we weren't supposed to drink alcohol on on teams but um just an amazing feeling and just made us feel at home and did the did you teach the canadians how to celebrate did they, did they come up to the level that the Australians are kind of born at? Uh, no, the Canadians knew how to party. <laughs> okay. I was still very young. They, they taught me a thing or two. T tell us about that world championship race. Uh, I think you and I had a conversation earlier and you, you described this moment when you kind of were swimming all alone like you were supposed to and you looked over and there was a pack swimming not necessarily close to you and there's a lot of advantages to swimming in a pack so just just tell us about the swim tell us how it unfolded if you had a strategy did you work it yeah um you know i was a 20 year old uh i had so much um you know confidence in what i'd done beforehand like i trained so hard and i knew confidently there was no one at that that race that had trained harder than me and in um in the 90s we had a rule where you had to stay three meters away from swimmers so you had the first kilometer where you could you swam in a pack then you hit the 1k and you had to break off and all of our coaches were in a boat next to us and that's when they sort of picked you up and you broke away and you basically swam against other people but you swam your own race and this event we were all in a pack and we got to the 1K and I started to move away from this pack and I could see them all. There was probably about eight of them and they were all together and I kept wanting to go over and I was like, well, if they're in a pack, I'm going to try and utilise this because, you know, you use a lot less energy swimming in a pack than you do by yourself. And um, I must have had the only... Um, uh, um, Oh, what do you call it? The person, the official on the boat who was sticking to the rules. And so every time I went closer to the pack, he was like pulling me away and like going, no, 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 three, three, three. And so I got pulled off the pack and I could see them just going further and further away. And it was kind of devastating. And I got to a point where I was in fourth place and I just was thinking in my head, I can't go home without a medal. Like I just can't, like I put in so much work and I, I just can't. And I really had that mind switch of like, oh, I think I'll get out. Like, you know, I'd rather get out than not get a medal. Um, and then I just went, okay, well, we're coming up to the hotel Neanderthal. I'll swim to Neanderthal and then, you know, I can just swim to the beach that way, you know. And then as we were coming to the Neanderthal, I was catching up to um, Anne Cheneau. She was in third place. And I was like, could see her and I went, you know, I'm just going to work until I get to, to her and then, then I'll see and see what happens. And then there was just a switch. And I remember like I could 
I can see where I am in the ocean. I can imagine where Dick Campion is, my, my coach in the boat next to me, and this switch, and I just went, no, nah, not going to happen. And it was just a sort of this very, and it happened so many times during my career, and I just went, nope, I'm going after it. And I just went and I, I swam and I passed Anne at around Hotel Neanderthal. And I went, okay, Shelley's next. And I only know this because my coach is writing on the whiteboard and telling me these kind of things. And, you know, I kept, I swam and, and then I could see Shelley. And then all of a sudden a boat became between us. So Shelley was in front of me. There was a boat in between us and it was um, Chris Gesden and his wife and some um, Australian um, media people and they were all like yay and cheering us both on and you know eating watermelon and I'm like come on you know you could be eating anything else but watermelon at this stage and then they the boat just went and I was like oh, okay and so I looked to my right and I couldn't see Shelly so then I put my head down and then my next stroke I looked up to see where she was couldn't see her in front of me and then I was like, the next one I went, oh, okay. So I remember turning over and being on my back and I went, oh my God, I passed Shelly now, I'm in second. And I just kept working and then I just kept going. Peggy was in, in first place and I kept working towards her. And I remember the coastline was very, very flat going into Terracina. And there was this one big tall building and we knew it was 5K from the finish. And I was working with a sports psychologist in the time leading up to, to Worlds. And he was very big in breaking down the swim. And we, we worked on, you know, all of these kind of things. So if, you know, if this happened, what would you do? If this is happening, what would you do? So we had all of these backup plans. And a lot of it was that building's 5K from the end. What are you going to do if you're not winning? And I was like, I remember sitting there and I'd make up all of these things. I'd go, oh, I imagine, visualized that this would happen and this would happen. But I couldn't. Like in the whole prep leading up, I could never see me not being in first place at that building and not winning. And I remember coming up to this building and Peggy was there and I was like working towards her. And then, oh, sorry, Peggy, Rita. Um, and working towards her. And then I just passed her and... And it was just before this 5K building and my coach, Dick, he um, wrote on, <laughs> on the whiteboard, you're now the queen. And that five, that last 5K, I just kept going on and getting stronger and everyone, because they'd worked in this pack and burnt too much energy early on, just sort of dropped off. And that last K was, you know, even now I've still got the goosebumps that's, you know, you're coming into a finish and there's the Italian crowd and there's flags everywhere and you can hear the sound in the water and, you know, your coach drops off and you do that last 1K by yourself and you just have all of these emotions of, you know, everything that you've worked for, everything you've given up, all those childhood dreams just all happened and then you just hit that, that wall and it's just, you know, a feeling that you can try and describe but you, you just never can. There aren't too many world champions in uh, marathon swimming who, are, who who can will understand everything you're saying. I'm 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 trying to catch on a little bit. Um, Shelley Taylor Smith was was the queen. She multi-time world champion. Was that the first time you'd beaten her in a race? It was, yeah. And it did was, you uh, did you stop and take a scalp and hook it onto your swimsuit, or you just kept going? No, I just kept going. <laughs> No, I didn't do that at all. No. When, was, when they when, when when you when they put the notice board that said Shelley's in front of you, was it the the mythical Shelley of 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 fame or was it just another swimmer? Just another swimmer. And you know, that whole kind of um you know, the beginning of the swim, I think I probably let it get a little sort of third names in the the water with me. I think I, I could have kind of got a bit overwhelmed. And then when I hit that turning point, everyone was just another swimmer in the water and they were just one step away from me getting to what I wanted, where I wanted to be. So we, uh, we interviewed uh, David O'Brien, uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, and what I said to him is I said, you, you were part of this sort of golden era of Australian marathon swimming. Um, and um, 
and we talked a little bit about it, but you you now have a tremendous amount of experience in the organization and administration and management of all this stuff. So Mel, why was that the golden age? Did the government do something special? We were just a group of great athletes. Was Dick Campion the best coach in the world? Was Chris Keeson the best manager? Did they did they manage you? You know why? Um, I think it was it was a perfect storm. You know, Shelley um, was there and really paved the way. Like she was the reason I became an open water swimmer. And we had David and we had Tammy and this great group of swimmers that sort of put it out there that this was another way that you could swim outside of the pool. And there was like just an amazing group of people that led us. So there was Chris Gesden, who was the manager of um, all of our teams. Dick Campion, who was who ended up being my coach, was the head coach. And they had a real vision of where they wanted Australian swimming to be for open water. And we had a Grand Prix series. Um, you know, we had training camps. There was very little funding um, from the government at all. We had to fight for pretty much everything we had, um, including uniforms. Um, I remember going to Pampax in 95 and having a swimsuit that just wasn't suitable for open water swimming. And I wore a different suit that had the Australian emblem. It pretty much looked exactly the same, but it was a different cut. And being told as I was walking to the start line, if I didn't change my swimsuit, they wouldn't let me swim. Um, and we were just sort of like the paupers, but Chris and Dick's vision really led us. And I think the big difference was that there was a change from Shelley and David to, to me and then um, David Bates and Grant Robinson and Tracy Knowles is that we came from a, a strong swimming background and we were still strong at the time. It wasn't like we were at the end of our pool career and then came into open water. We were right in the middle of it and still competing at a national level and we were fast and we trained hard. And um, yeah, I think that that sort of put it all together to, to be this really strong team of swimmers for, for a long time. Um, one of the things when you talk about team, uh, a lot of the um, swimming honorees, most of all the swimming honorees talk about it being a team and not being a solo event. You had some wonderful things to say about Sue Gisden when she was inducted into the Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. Uh, tell everybody who she is. Uh, tell everybody her, her contribution and then put it into very personal terms so, so people understand what the, the broadest sense of team. So um, Sue's married to Chris Gesden and Sue is the driving force to get a lot of things done for Australian open water swimming is what we call it and has been quiet and never wanted to step forward, never wanted a name on anything and um, personally to me, I, when I was swimming, I went to stay with them many times, but I think my biggest, um, connection with Sue is that before every world championships, she put my grease on for me. So she was my, my lucky charm. And, um, I consider them, they're my family. They're my extended family. And, um, you know, at times where things weren't going great in my life, they've always been such a driving force to, to stand behind me and be big cheerleaders. Um, and it goes sort of hand in hand with Dick and Jackie Campion. So I was um, paired up with Dick as my handler and in Italy in 93. And then not long after I asked to go to Melbourne to do a training camp with him. And two days later asked if I could stay and Dick and Jackie let me into their house and they're my mum and dad and they're my adopted mum and dad. And after having not such a great childhood, having those two um, be that family for me and the Gesdens as well has been, you know, the biggest highlight for me of my swimming career. The viewers who, who might um, wonder what all the grease stuff is about, um, whether you're a racer or whether you're a traditional epic marathon swimmer, the last person you talk to is the person who's helping you grease up 
and they're the person who has the last words for you, which could be anything from you're going to kill it to it's going to be the greatest day in the, in the history of the world to uh, don't mind the fact it's four, six winds going to get calmer later. Um, they, they, they often lie completely to you, but you, 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 you accept to believe everything they're telling you and, and they greatly influence your your mood when you get in the water and and that it's an incredibly personal and influential role that you know most sports have, have no idea about you know this isn't somebody that's tying your shoes in a basketball game this is this is a very personal the last person that touches you before you get in the water yeah and sue has that such calming um, manner and as you were saying that i was trying to think what did she say to me and i can't remember anything she said but i remember that feeling of calmness and just knowing she knew she knew and she was there and you know a couple of times she for, for different events she flew to join us just so she could do that for me and you know as I said didn't have the best childhood and having those people around me that just were the pillars of of that time in my life you know I get a bit teary when I think about it you, uh, you, you also unusually for uh, an epic racer did a couple of the traditional or epic swims. And one of them was this fascinating uh, Malta to Italy relay. Um, yeah. And I know you always wanted to go to Italy. So clearly that was the reason you did it. Uh, but tell us how that all came, came to be. Um, so we went to, uh, well, we thought it was world championships in 96. Um, in Evian, uh, FINA told us it was World Championships. Um, and then afterwards, they've come out and said it was a World Cup. So there's this whole, you know, feeling of a couple of swimmers there that, that we believed we were world champions after that, that event and were told we were only World Cup winners. But that whole trip, we went to do Malta to Sicily, we went to Ponza in Italy and to do a, a few other swims, but we did this multi Malta to Sicily event. And um, there were four of us in that event and there were a couple of other teams that were swimming. And it was just this amazing event that, you know, you're swimming in the middle of the night and um, you can't see anything. And it was just, a, it was a cool swim. Like I've never swum overnight before. So um, it was just a really good team atmosphere that we had there. And then the, all the comfort of, of swimming in, in, a, in, a, in a great ocean with a great team, going to a place you want to be. Contrast that with the first time you got in the shark cage going out to Magnetic Island. Well, for, 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 for comfort now. Well, <laughs> interesting. That's my, that was my actual first open water swim ever. And I think now if I look back and I go, how did I go from being in a cage, swimming 8K in shark infested waters to swimming 25K? And um, yeah, it, 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 it's different. Like it's hard. It's like swimming in a washing machine. And, um, you know, over the years, I always get asked, have you ever had a shark, a shark sighting? And the only time that there's ever been a shark in any swim was the second time I swam Magnetic Island. And um as you're swimming, as you go over to Magnetic Island, they tow the, the, the cage and you need to get into the cage and practice swimming at a certain speed so the boat knows how fast to go and you, you know where you need to sit within the cage, swim within the cage. And oh, I hated it. Like I hated swimming in the cage. Like I've got chipped bones and, you know, I had shoulder, you know, injuries from it and things like that. And I remember getting out and my, obviously my coach wasn't with me. I was with a friend and I said, I'm going to get out from the boat, swim to the cage, swim around the cage, get in the cage, swim. And then I'll get out and swim back to the boat. And they're like, okay, that's fine. And I did that. And then we swam across and then I got out of the cage and I did a big loop around the boat to get back into the boat. Cause I just needed to sort of like, stretch out and not feel that confinement. And I remember everyone's leaning over the boat going, get in the boat, get in the boat. And I'm like, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. They're like, no, get in the boat. And I'm like, okay, like, all right, chill out. And so I, apparently as I'm getting into one side of the boat, a shark came up on the other side of the boat and very kindly they didn't tell me about it. Um, 
until after I'd finished the event. But I remember we got to Magnet Carland and I was like, well, I'm going to go swim to the island and back just to stretch out. And they're like, no, you're not. You're getting straight in the, in the cage and you're not getting anywhere else. So, um, yeah, and that's the only time I ever saw, a sh well, had a shark in a swim. And it was so horrible you did it four times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if you get, you know, some prize money and, you know, the only, the second female to win an event like that, which was sort of a, a prestige event and still is um, within Australia, you know, what's a shark or two? And uh, one of the other bizarre things you did was setting a Guinness record for the 24 hour swim. Why, how, I presume it wasn't in an endless pool like Yoko just recently did because they didn't exist, but where were you? Well, <laughs> this is one of those other random stories. I was training with my coach before Dick and we come back from Olympic trials in 92 and he'd suggested I do an open water swim. And I was just like, no, you're going to be crazy. He'd want to do that. And, you know, I took, I was taking a year off and I was trying to do pool swimming and I wasn't really into it. And then we were going to Magnetic Island for the first time. And I remember at training one day, I just randomly said, I wonder how far I could swim in a day. And within a month, I was doing a swim in a day. And um, we did it at Chandler where they had the 82 Olymp uh, Commonwealth Games, which was my pool at the time in Queensland. And um, my coach, Ian Finlay, who passed away last year, unfortunately, he walked pretty much every single lap of that 93K I did in 24 hours. And um, I remember we, we were going for the men's world record, which I just missed. But when I broke the um, existing women's record and I had about five, four or five hours to go and I got out and I went to the bathroom and I remember I didn't go to the bathroom. I just sat on the floor because there was the whole center was closed at that stage. And I was like, just bawling my eyes out because I just had enough. Like, how do you prepare for something like this? And he just walked in and goes, what are you doing? And I'm like, I can't do it anymore. And he's like, uh, get up and get in that water and you're going to finish it and you're going to finish strong. And, um, you know, it was a pretty crazy swim. Um, I hadn't even, I had done one 25 K swim before that. And, you know, being in the pool for 24 hours, it, it burnt all my um, taste buds and all of my sinuses. After that, I became allergic to chlorine. Um, I couldn't lift my arms up for days on end after that. And um, it really changed, I think, my biology, my, my, um, my body, but also made me tough. And it made me realize how tough I was. Well, you're lucky it wasn't Frida Streeter who came in the locker room. The reason I wear the earphones is Frida got a hold of my ear one day and tried to drag me through a, a partially open car window because she didn't like the way I was getting warm or something. Uh, Mel, when you retired from elite swimming, you threw yourself into being a contributor. You've been a referee. You've been a race organizer. Um, you're on the uh, Hall of Fame committee. You just helped start an Australian Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. It's, so first of all, thank you for putting so much back into the sport. Tell us some of the things that you particularly enjoyed along the way on that journey. Um, I think that first part of being part of FINA when I would just finish. So my last race was in 98. And then um, in 2000, I was part of the um, FINA Athletes Commission and then on the Technical Open Water Swimming Committee. And just seeing that whole different side you know you're an athlete and you're very insular and you know that there's a team around you and you know there's people there and you know you meet the same people at all of the events that are putting them on but you don't really see and I don't think you're aware of what happens behind the scenes and um, this amazing group of people which included Chris and um, Sid Cassidy and um, Dennis Miller they really took me under their wings and showed me what it was about and we were very lucky on the technical committee for FINA as an athlete usually you're just there as a you know we say in Australia bum on a seat you don't have a say no one really listens to what you what you have to contribute and I was allowed to vote on everything whether it was recorded officially or not 
the whole committee wanted to know what the athletes thought. Um, you know, it was the early days of, of email. I had an email um, chain with swimmers and when they went to their to world championships and they're in the, the marshalling or the, the meeting beforehand, they used to give me all their emails and we used to stay in contact. And if I couldn't help them, then I'd pass it on to the right person. But we did the first open water championships by themselves. And um, I was thinking about this leading into here. What are some of the things that I did there? And it was just little things like um, it was my idea to put their number on the back of the hand for when they touched the, the touch board for the first time. Um, the other one was that, the boys that didn't want to wear hat or girls who didn't want to wear a hat and they shaved their hair about being able to have their, their country codes on their, their cap. But I think the biggest one was um, being there when, when we were trying to get into the Olympics and seeing that whole, um, the process and being able to be part of that was, was pretty amazing. Just, just be, when people talk about shaving their heads, I was inducted into the Hall of Fame the same year as Martin Vanderveeg. Um, he had famously shaved his head and written Ned on the side of it. The number of people that got me confused with Martin in, um, in Long Beach was very, very satisfying, I have to say. I, I'm not sure I, I straightened everybody out, but I had good fun with this. Um, congratulations on the recent Australia uh, Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. Tell everybody how the group of you decided who that first induction group was going to be, because having done a couple of Hall of Fames, if you get the first group wrong, a lot of bricks flying, a lot of people hate you, and the criticism is unbelievably harsh. So how did you, how did you avoid all of that and keep everybody pretty happy? Well, there are so many great Australian marathon swimmers um, and the list is, is, you know, quite long. And we all sat down and we, we came up with a list that we thought, and it was a couple of hundred. And um, then we kind of worked backwards. So we thought the, the first ones had to be the people that have already, already been inducted to the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. So there's 17 um, swimmers and contributors then we had fina world championship medalists and then we had some coaches that had um coached world champions and high level swimmers and had been in the sport for quite a long time and contributed in multiple areas and then we had a contributor as well um, and then we also had an ocean seven swimmer to sort of round it out um, for the the epic swimmers and um yeah, it's 37, you know, people, but it could easily be a couple of hundred. And, and what we've decided to do is rather than um, do it once a year, we're going to do it uh, every three to four months until we sort of get a good group of people into the Hall of Fame. And then um, we'll, we'll pull it out until um, sort of maybe six to, to 12 months going, going forward. Well, congratulations, um, a, a great accomplishment. And I think um, these, these Hall of Fames are, are fabulous for the sport. Um, they, they give you an excuse to get together for dinner and a few drinks once a year. Um, the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame can only take so many. And there again, you know, for every one we take, there's a hundred or a thousand, you know, great candidates around the world. And when they're tucked into a national Hall of Fame like that, it, 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 it it, it just, it's the correct thing. Last question for you, Mel. Um, several of our, our folks have talked about worries for the future of the ultra marathon um, sport, if you will, at the elite level. Do you have any views on, on that? Um, in competition? The numbers seem to be going down. The sponsorship seems to be tough. And some people are going, oh, we're getting a bit frightened about the future of this part of the sport because and part of the, the Olympics with it, the 10 K focus. Yeah, I think um, it, it's changed a lot, definitely in the last 20 years. And I think having us in the Olympics in some way is always going to be great for our sport. Um, and it's always a lead in for, um, competitors to go from the pool to 10k and then hopefully um, 
for epic, epic swims. Um, but also, I think the big world is becoming so much smaller. And when I was swimming, it was very hard to, to find an event or to know what else was happening. Um, but now with the internet and you always say GPS and the world being able to jump on a plane for, for um, cheap flights. But I think the, the community's grown and I think that's always going to be great for our sport. So when Sarah Thomas did her four way um, swim of the channel, I must've been on about 10 or 12 group chats and who knows how many individual chats and people were like, well, what have you got? What have you heard? And what have you heard? And then, well, I've heard this and I've heard that. And that whole community behind the scenes of just connecting from all over the world and knowing and um, then passing it on to people around them. So in Melbourne, we've got like a really, we've always had a really great open water community and it's now easier for people to go and do the channel and um, ocean sevens. And now we have um, our own um, Australian, I can't remember Triple what it's crown. called. Triple crown. Thanks, Ned. Uh, it's been a long day. Um, we, we have that now where people can, can work towards. So I kind of feel like it can only get better. Okay. I, I don't, I'm not worried. So I maybe, so, so, so maybe what you're saying is that if we look at the traditional epic side of the sport, the, the 25 K and above is, is exploded. You know, it's an increase of factor of five or 10 or 20. And on the elite racing, maybe it's down 10, 15%. And, and maybe we're, maybe we've got too narrow a focus on, on that particular aspect. Well, I think the 25K is dead uh, in, at FINA level, which makes me very sad because, you know, that's where, where we started. And I think there's, it, it's such a different event from a 5 or a 10K. I think 10K, while it's in the Olympics, you'll always get Olympic funding, which makes it a lot easier for swimmers to swim and compete and have some funding to be able to go overseas, which we didn't have in my day um, so much. So we had a little bit. Um, but I think that going from sort of like the, the 10 K to those, um, FINA longer distance world cup events, that's always going to have a certain niche number of, of swimmers. Well, Mel, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, for those of you who don't realize that uh, we start these things often at 5 AM for Steve Munitonis and, and Mel joined us at uh, 10 PM in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and I'm somewhere in the middle. So it's a, uh, when Mel says it's been a long day, depending on where you are in the world, that'll help you help you appreciate it. So thank you again, Mel. Thank you so much, Ned. Appreciate it.